I, I feel like I'm interrupting a nice party, um, which I, is a little bit in, in uh, nicely aligned with the Loeb world. So um, welcome to our senior Loeb Scholar Lecture with Malkit Shoshan, whose lecture is entitled Design, Designing Within Conflict. Before I introduce this evening's event, I ask that we all pause to think about this topic within this space, in this place that is the GSD. So our school is sited on the ancestral land of the Massachusetts people. In short, we're all within a space of historic conflict. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past, present, and future, recognizing that this land remains sacred to them. Part of our collective work here at the school is understanding that property always comes laden with histories, and those histories are oftentimes neither straightforward nor benevolent. Please take note that we have live captioning available for our virtual audience. Hello, Zoomlanders. Um, just click on the closed captioning button at the bottom of the live stream window. For our audience here in Piper, live captioning is available via the link or QR code up on that screen. I promise that if you use it, it will give you captions on your phone. Please visit the AV booth if you have any difficulties doing that. Please also take note that we have a second public program this week. This Thursday, Elizabeth Meyer will present the Daniel Urban Kiley Lecture entitled Unsettling Sustainability, Landscape Laboratories as Experimental and Experiential Grounds. For more information on Beth's talk and additional events, please visit the GSD's website. So I mentioned already that tonight is the Senior Loeb Scholar Lecture. Let me explain that a little more. So when the GSD kicked off its capital campaign in 1968, the theme was crisis, the chaos in our cities, the loss of control over our environment, the urgent need for leadership for the future. Working closely with Bill Doble, who was professor of city and regional planning, now emeritus, John Loeb, who chaired that campaign and who, along with his wife Frances, ultimately endowed the program, created the Loeb Fellowship which annually brings to the GSD a group of about 10 exceptional individuals, urban planners and designers, public artists, real estate developers, the list goes on, landscape architects, journalists, civic leaders, architects, policymakers, social entrepreneurs, and others whose work makes the world better by changing our natural and built environments. John Peterson, himself a Loeb Fellow alum, is the curator of the Loeb Fellowship. I'd like for John and any of our current Loebs here this evening to please stand. Do we have, ah, hang on. All right, you can applaud them. Um, do we have any Loeb alumni in the audience? Please stand. Oh, Rob, you can get up. <laughs> so, to all our students and faculty, I hope you've discovered just how valuable the lobes are to the GSD's ecosystem. They extend us outward to address environmental risks, racial and equity tensions, global conflicts, and transformative innovations at scales large and small, local and global. The Senior Loeb Scholars Program enables the school to invite prominent individuals whose, I'm quoting from the website here, whose expertise is outside the normal disciplines of the GSD or whose practice displays a unique focus for short-term residency at the school. So it may surprise some that Malkit Shoshan is our Senior Loeb this year. Malkit is no stranger to the GSD. She's been teaching here for, I think, about seven years. Um, she was the head of the art, design, and public domain area of the previous iteration of the MDES program. She's currently a design critic in urban planning and design here at the GSD. She's also te she's teaching an urban uh, UPD seminar, spatial design strategies for climate migration, as well as an MDES open project entitled Forms of Assembly, All Things Considered, Pache NPR. 
Malkit, who is the founder and director of the architectural think tank FAST, Foundation for Achieving Seamless Territory, curated the Love in the Mist, the Politics of Fertility show, the, which was the fall 2019 exhibition in the Drucker Gallery. It's actually the exhibition that welcomed me here to the GSD. That was my first semester. That exhibition presaged the Supreme Court's Dobbs de decision, in addition to other contemporary environmental, political, and societal crises. In general, Malkit's practice uses spatial design tools to make visible systemic violence, to engage with various publics to co-design alternatives that center social and environmental justice, and to advocate for systemic change. She's authored many books, including, among others, Blue, The Architecture of UN Keeps, Peacekeeping Missions, and Atlas of the Conflict, Israel-Palestine. While I suppose that Malkit fits into that first category of senior lobe, those whose expertise is outside the normal disciplines of the GSD, I would argue that she models what we all should be doing as citizens of the GSD, using design writ large to create new modes of understanding and new and better futures. Malkit will lead a series of lobe events across this entire calendar year, focusing on spaces of conflict. The series actually began already the first week of this semester when she shared her perspective on the recent war in Gaza and opened a dialogue about how one can even begin to talk about such things. Indeed, the topics that Malkit takes on are not easy. They don't have single, simple answers. But she, const she constructs texts and images, her own words, her drawings, her photographs, films, and installation, as well as assembling archives of the works of others with a language, style, and empathy that is honestly quite unique. I can think of no one better to shepherd us through the difficult territory of spaces of conflict, no one better to offer us a model of how we might, all of us as citizens of the world, offer up our own answers to John Loeb's campaign theme of 1968, crisis, the chaos in our cities, the loss of control of our, over our environment, the urgent need for leadership for the future. Sadly, these challenges still demand our attention. I want to thank Malkit for her willingness to lead our school into this difficult topic. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, the inviting, uh, for all the generous words and um, introduction and aspiration toward the future. I hope I will do a good job. Uh, but um, let me just start diving directly into the presentation because I might have make it too long. Uh, so. Although my presentation today should ideally speak for itself, as Sarah mentioned, it is also a continuation of uh, the event we held here uh, three weeks ago. Let's see how this works. Um, during that event, uh, I shared my personal experience and began to talk about the built environment capacity as a record and a repository uh, of complex personal and cultural histories. Uh, as I proposed then, building buildings embody the societal context from which conflict emerge, uh, offering a comprehensive understanding of the broader historical, uh, social, political, and economic arcs that make a uh, weight for violence. Through the tools of architecture and urban design, we can uncover the underlying structures, meaning, and dynamics that shape our uh, lived reality, revealing the layers of history, power relations, and cultural expressions that have long been arranged in our spaces. These spaces are not solely urban and spatial phenomena, nor can they be understood from only the God's eye view of the architectural plan. They represent rather, and crucially, the lived experiences of the many individuals uh, who interface uh, with them. In today's talk, I'll share how we can use architecture and urban design tool to comprehend 
uh, engage with and intervene in these spaces and advocate for change while amplifying su suppressed voices and promoting counter narratives that center social and environmental justice. I'll begin then with another title. So I'm adding another title for my presentation. No one asked me to come, but here I am, which I borrowed from one of Gertrude Krauss' solo dance performances, The Strange Guest. Her performance was meant to express her struggle of, uh, to belong and find home in a state of perpetual conflict. Gertrude Krauss was born in Vienna in 1901 a dancer, choreographer, and educator, known for her contribution to modern dance. She, de she developed a style of ex uh, expressive dance that explored human concerns, uh, or sorry, explored human emotions, uh, identity, and social concerns, and was associated with the 20th century European expressionist uh, movement. Her performances were characterized by their emotional intensity, by their vocabulary of innovative movements, and by the theatrical elements, the gestures, the music, the costumes, Krauss used to convey psychological and emotional depth. Um, she also worked at that time as the assistant of uh, Rudolf uh, von Laben, who was known to some as the father of modern dance. Laban, for his part, believed that dance should be available to everyone. He championed dance as what he called a movement, a choir for amateur, a vehicle for mass gatherings where people could come together to celebrate the mystical, or, uh, the mystical and uh, reach a higher reality. With the rise of Nazism in uh, Europe, Laban's and Gertrude's uh, lives both completely changed. Laban found himself swept up in the currents of Nazi life. Through the, uh, he, though he initially avoided explicitly ideological affiliation with the party, his uh, early choreography, particularly his uh, idea of uh, movement choir, uh, was attractive for the party and for his experiments, which he turned into a new folk dance movement of the white race, which seems tailor-made uh, tailor for the Nazi propaganda machine. Rather quickly, he was named the director of the Berlin State Opera Ballet and oversaw public performances under the uh, aegis of the um, Nazi propaganda ministry. Krauss, meanwhile, took a different path, traumatized uh, by the new reality in Europe. She successfully escaped to Palestine, where she reinvented herself in the only way she knew best, uh, the arts. While Laban's work, uh, work was performed uh, at some of the most prominent stages in Europe, Krauss' choreography began a new life in her friend's uh, basement in Tel Aviv. From there, she went on to establish the Tel Aviv's first modern dance company. The earlier uh, 20th century witnessed the emergence of synthetically created communities, each of, uh, of which grappled with harsh realities through experiments with new lifestyles. One such example is the alternative Swiss colony of Monteverita, established on the principles of primitive socialism, strict morality, uh, self-sufficiency, and nudism. Monteverita members included uh, the aforementioned uh, father of, of modern dance, Laban, and the artist, uh, Hugo Ball, who was known for having a relationship with the skull of a young woman that he found in a destroyed European cemetery during the First World War, and he carried it around with him. The colonists of Monteverita wanted to abolish the old world the, uh, of elitist hierarchy, monarchy, and aristocracy, and they dogmatically rejected societal convention of marriage, of a tier, of uh, politics. They were, however, hopeless farmers, uh, as it turned out, and on the brink of starvation, they were forced to return to the city and face the beginning of another world war. 
Nonetheless, Monteverita served as a, an inspiring uh, or an inspiration for artist communities worldwide. And in 1950s, Israel, Hassan Hussein, a resident of a small village near Haifa, found himself caught up in the revival of this avant-garde movement in Israel. Before his displacement, Hassan and his family lived in the heart of the old Palestinian village of Enchud, nested at the foot of Mount Carmel. They sustained the, the, the community sustained themselves by cultivating their land, obtaining food, medicine, and building material from the soil. As skilled farmers, they tended to fertile fields and produced wheat, lentils, vegetables, onions, and fodder for livestock, together with uh, olives. Hassan, along with other villagers, was also skilled in construction and masonry, which uh, was made evident by the longevity of his home, a typical Arab house resembling other in the region. The two-story dwelling features uh, arched architecture, spacious, uh, spacious interior and gardens, both within and surrounding the property. A street facing a masonry wall led to a welcoming garden that would accommodate family and guests and also house uh, domestic animals. The house ground floor uh, boasts extensive, sorry, expensive, well lit uh, collective spaces supported by pointed arches, such as a covered wall, living uh, a covered hall, living room, kitchen, and uh, an indoor staircase leading to the bedrooms above. Niches in the wall provided shelving, storage, and seating, com uh, complemented by col colorful textiles, curtains, and carpets, adding uh, vibrancy to the interior. In 1948, after the end of the British mandate in Palestine and the declaration of the State of Israel and the Arab-Israel War, Hassan Hussein's home was confiscated by the Israeli army. He and his family were forced to empty the village and leave it behind. Tormented by the loss of their home and properties, Hassan and his family found refuge in the mountain. They remained in the vicinity of their former home on the same uh, land that once sustained them and hid in a prehistoric cave. The mountain continued to shelter them. Meanwhile, the newly established Israeli government treated an hood uh, as a deserted property and an outlet for succession of different functions. First used by the Israeli army as a training ground uh, for combat uh, in a dense urban environment or in an urban environment. Uh, and Hood was uh, later populated with Jewish immigrants from Tunis, but this immigrant soon left claiming the place was hunted by demons. Later, the stone houses sheltered a group of Orthodox Jews displaced from the newly declared Jordanian territory in what today consider the occupied West Bank as they uh, waited for the concrete structures of their new kibbutz to be uh, completed. Eventually, uh, like the Tunisian immigrants, they too left. The village, however, did not remain empty for long. In the early 1950s, the Romanian-born uh, artist and architect, Marcel Yanko, one of the initiator of uh, a Cabaret Voltaire and the Dada movement, and the prominent figure of the Zurich avant-garde movement, together with Hugo Ball, was touring Mount Carmel, and he happened to uh, find an hood. Like Gertrude Krauss, Janko has fled Europe for Palestine after witnessing a Nazi pogrom. Immersed in the empowering uh, Palestinian scenery, walls, gardens, smells, and remains, Kraus and, Yak and Yanko occupied in Hood, sorry, as a found uh, object. Sorry, I think I missed something. Um, can you help me go to a f previous slide? Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, so after the establishment of Israel, I'm sorry about that. After the establishment of Israel, he helped the new government planning authorities to map the country's potential uh, parks. That was Yanko. Um, and Hood reminded him of Monte Verita, and he decided, so after he, uh, he found, uh, he discovered it, it, he decided to turn it into an artist colony and invited his friends uh, to join. Hassan House was given to one of the first to arrive, Gertrude Krauss. Immersed in the overpowering Palestinian scenery, walls, gardens, smells, and remains, Krauss and Yanko occupied an hood as a found object. They indulged in the landscape as dreamly uh, vernacular and continued to narrate it, to rewrite its origin, while continuously ignoring its original inhabitants and builders. They attempted to connect to the, to the landscape, and in the process invented a new identity for themselves, for the village, and by extension for the country. And who'd become an en hod, phonemic uh, uh, simplification that changed the spelling and meaning of the name from Arabic to Hebrew. Though um, Krauss and Yanko may have been uh, unthinking in their narration, their renaming like other European uh, colonial practices was a symbolic assertion of colonial power, raising indigenous names and histories in favor of new colonial narratives. Yanko and Krauss, in any case, transformed themselves and the village. But even as Krauss was about uh, creating a new world, she could not leave behind the feeling of foreignness. Her desire for belonging was already present in her uh, early performance in Europe. In The Strange Guest, one of, the, one of her first uh, choreographed uh, solo dances, she envisioned a nomad, a mysterious violinist she herself, uh, that she herself played, accompanied by the adage, no one asked me to come, but here I am. Krauss performed the dance in Palestine in the uh, 1930s, but it was perceived as a strange uh, gesture. She desperately tried to detach herself from the burden of her past and the wars of Europe. In Palestine, she created new lighter dance inspired by Laban. She tried to merge with the new climate to let, her, uh, to let it form her. She stepped out of the built environment uh, left the indoors and danced outside in nature. She wore airy garments that camouflaged her skin and her body uh, movement within the local uh, scenery. At home, inside of Hassan's house, her detachment from history was also apparent. The war had left the house damaged with an incomplete ceiling and holes in the walls. Concrete blocks were used to patch the missing parts. Krauss painted all of Hassan's uh, walls white. The stone uh, arches now appeared as separate, ob separate objects, detached from their own history and functionality, an, an, an empty adornment. The thin layer of plaster and white paint she applied, um, her attempt to make to make a white cube ready for new histories, ideas, and narratives failed to fully remove Hassan's labor. Over time, both the house and Krauss seems to be influenced by Hassan's stone. As the years went by, Krauss gradually devoted more and more of her time to sculpting, to sculpting locally found stones than to dance. Well, artists uh, continued to uh, transform the village of Enhod, Hassan's family established a new settlement within, a, uh, within sight of their former home. Their name, um, they named the new uh, village the New Enhod, after their old village, which the Israeli authorities did not officially rec recognize until 2004. While the artists tried to disconnect from history, the Palestinian villagers of the new Enhud were denied their history and deemed tre trespassers by the new state, leaving them to endure a life devo uh, devoid of civic rights. New state uh, institution employed bureaucratic mechanism to exacerbate the marginalization of the community, refusing to acknowledge their existence. 
living without a formal address, for example, meant that they were denied access to essential civic rights and services such as water and electricity. The, improv the improvised shelters uh, that slowly rose in the new village were not carefully constructed over time in the traditional dense cluster typical of uh, Arab settlements where shaded uh, spaces and, so and social proximity flourished. Instead, the new village was swiftly erected using concrete blocks rather than uh, masoned uh, stones. The villagers uh, intentionally spaced their homes far apart on hilltops, strategically position positioning them to guard against potential threats and to thwart any attempts to destroy all the shelters at once. Until the 1980s, each family uh, resided in a modest three by four meter bare concrete cube. The cubed uh, structure served both as a living room uh, by day and bedroom by night. Until this day, many of those homes remain isolated from um, amenities such as water, electricity, and sewage system. In 1968, Gertrude Krauss was honored with Israel's first prize for dance. The artist commune she was part of played a pivotal role in shaping the modern ethos, aesthetics, and cultural identity that continue to define Israel to this day. This story taught us, among others, that uh, art, by its elusive and detached nature, can offer freedom and f uh, freedom from facts, facilitating a, seamlessly, a seamless transition between the imagined and the real. It uh, has the capacity to envision alternative realities for better or for worse, making it a powerful tool for affecting cultural change in a very short time. After Krauss' death uh, in the late uh, 1970s, her belongings were donated to the uh, village of Enhod, to the artist colony. Hassan's former house uh, now stands as a tribute for her legacy and spirit. Uh, its white um, cavernous interior serves as a gallery and stage for various cultural events, including jazz and theater performances, operas, concerts, family gathering, and birthday parties. Amid conflict, multidimensional violence, and collective and individual trauma, and amid the inter, uh, intertwining narratives and realities of Enhud and Enhod, where indigeneity intersect with modernity, there exists a space that holds not only violence, but also life, teeming with beauty and hope. It is within this layered complexity that I decided to start FAST, the Foundation for Achieving a Stimulus Territory. So I co-founded FAST uh, in 2005 uh, as an Amsterdam-based architectural think tank and a platform from which to develop, as Sarah mentioned earlier in the introduction, um, collaborative projects and promote social and environmental uh, justice. As I mentioned earlier, I understand uh, the built environment as a highly complex system and entangled with socioeconomic and cultural forces, with ideology, with politics, with the natural world. Uh, fast uh, begins with the understanding that everything we form in the physical world shapes our quality of life and forms our relationship with our surroundings. The idea of FAST then is to be a vehicle through which to question and explore what constitutes and forms the built environment. Through our work, we ask how architecture tools and format can make such forces visible and how we can engage with the public domain more broadly. Our projects make visible the mechanism behind and the consequences of spatial uh, production and violence on people's livelihood and the environment. We engage with various publics and co-develop counter-narratives, and we use these counter-narratives to try to influence cultural and systemic change. For example, in this slide, there are two, um, uh, several events that we organized at uh, the headquarters of the, U of the United Nations in New York City. 
This series of high and expert level meetings are part of our long-term research and advocacy project, Blue, which explores the diverse impact of UN missions on cities, communities, and the environment. Blue began in 2007 as an open-ended exploration that coincided throughout with design experimentation rooted in activism. It is an unsolicited project that emerged after a visit to Kosovo, where compounds, camps, logistic hubs, headquarters, checkpoints, and all sorts of physical installations were swiftly built under the auspice of a UN mission, reaching a point where they began to dominate the local landscape. This foreign material presence raised many questions, such as how do these missions impact the local population? Uh, who designs them and for whom? Who pays for them? How are they being procured, built, and maintained? Uh, is the local population involved, and if so, how? And what will be left behind after the, mission, uh, after the missions are gone? To engage with these questions, we had to situate international peace missions within a broader historical, cultural, socioeconomic, and political context, and within the context of modernity. And we had to question the way we engage with our own professional field, namely the operative realm of architecture, not as a privately commissioned task, or as a narrowed, uh, framed academic question, or as critical theory. But we really wanted to use design to bring topic of concern into the public view, and at the same time to develop pragmatic processes that allow us to influence systemic change. And to do so, our um, field of study uh, and eventually intervention included the physical site in which UN missions take place, the institution it's, uh, itself, uh, in other words, the UN, its politics, protocols, procurement methods, and all sorts of uh, processes that operate at the background of its spatial production. And the, the third field is the, of our research and investigation was, uh, uh, was architecture. Uh, so to engage with uh, our initial questions, we had to invent also a new way to conduct research. Our visit to Kosovo was the jumping off point for a long journey and of exploration, improvisation, and interventions that you can uh, see also documented in the book Blue. Uh, the inquiry had no clear institutional support. We didn't have a, any target group in mind or audience, and it had no uh, defined relationship with one discipline or another. The subject itself was under-researched. The places in which peace missions take place and their special manifestation are notably invisible to people who are not directly impacted by them. Information about mission is mostly classified, hidden behind walls and firewalls. Uh, sites of missions are hard to access as they are situated in some of the most remote um, uh, in some of the most sorry, impoverished and imperiled areas of the world that lacks sufficient infrastructure, and at the same time they are enclosed and controlled by foreign security forces. Uh, in developing Blue, we had to build on our earlier experience and on our projects uh, with similar challenges. Uh, as all of our projects were self-initiated, unsolicited, and dealt with topics of enormous public importance, uh, that were under-researched, contested, or made invisible, like the Atlas of the Conflict. Um, so Atlas of the Conflict, Israel-Palestine, uses more than 500 maps to visualize the emergence of Israel and the disappearance of Palestine over the past century. For this project, we had to research and visualize special information that was either classified, inaccessible, or intentionally obscured. Much like the, rea the reality of the unrecognized villages, these spaces, often deemed informal, were left out of the public and formal special documentation. It took me about 10 years to conduct the research, produce the map, and publish the book. As the format of representation, the atlas emerged during the age of colonial expansion uh, in the 16th century and was always about uh, more than mere uh, data depiction. Its origin be, can be traced to a cartographer like Mercator, whose early atlases set the standards for subsequent ones. 
these atlases used collections of maps to visualize, uh, to visually depict uh, newly discovered lands, trade routes, and territorial claims, facilitating navigation and exploration during European colonization. Atlases played a pivotal role in legitimizing territorial conf conquests, serving as tools for, naviga uh, for navigation and shaping uh, perception of the world that systemically reinforced a uh, Eurocentric perspective, marginalized uh, indigenous knowledge, and perpetuated colonial ideology. Borders, for instance, often arbitrarily drawn by colonial powers, were solidified and imposed through atlases contributing to ongoing conflict and inequality. We use the atlas of the conflict to, to challenge this format of the atlas and to depict the different perspective and relational dynamics between Israel and Palestine across 10 chapters. The first chapter, titled Borders, visualizes the extensive history of colonization in the Middle East and in Palestine. It outlines the geopolitical transformation in the region following uh, the First World War, where European powers in uh, planning for the aftermath of the Ottoman Empire's dismantling arbitrarily divided the Middle East into British and French zones of influence. The legacy of this, borders, of this borderline remains at the root of many, uh, of many conflicts that have followed, conflicts with which we are now all too familiar. Other chapters include themes such as land ownership, typologies and distribution of settlements. And each chapter begin with a map, with a series of maps that conclude also the chapter. Uh, cultural heritage sites and memorials, water, demography, landscaping, and Jerusalem. One chapter in the atlas, for example, ex explores the typologies of settlements, including those considered illegal localities, sp spaces that are not recognized by local authorities as formal and legal, and therefore lacking access to state services, as I mentioned earlier. This top-down informality had led to counter-practice of construction. During the many days and hours that I spent in a small NGO in Haifa uh, representing the inhabitants of these, uh, villagers, of these villages, I gained insight into the relationship between master planning and demolition orders, where one hand builds and the other hand destroys. I also learned about how margin marginalized communities utilize uh, loopholes to avoid immediate home demolition, often resorting to legal proceedings to prolong their stay in their home. The phases of the constructions are visible in this slide. Another informal typology highlighted in the atlas is the single house settlements strategically positioned within densely populated Palestinian neighborhood. This placement aims to assert dominance and initiate a demographic shift in a selected neighborhood. So while the atlas illustrates the transformation of Israel and Palestine on a scale, uh, uh, on a national scale, uh, our next project, which I actually explore, extrapolated one, one story out of it uh, is called Village, One Land, Two Systems and Platform Paradise, and it zooms into a single point on the map, uh, the, uh, the village of Enchud. Navida navigating the complex space between justice and pragmatism, the book uh, narrates the ongoing daily struggle of the villagers, weaving together diverse narratives on forced migration uh, colonization and oppression, they also illustrate our effort to design a collaborative engagement process in collaboration with the villagers. Uh, and we also, at the same time, try to develop an alternative master, master plan uh, for use as a tool for negotiating with the Israeli authorities. It was through these methods that we could advocate for the community essential needs uh, such as safety and access to basic in infrastructure. Inspired by the history of this era, we used also, also socially engaged art to bring the master plan to life. 
we invited artists from around the world to join us in the new and hood and work with the local residents and translate their aspiration toward the future into a, a set of uh, installations. And those are some images from the work we've done at the village. So the next project that I'd like to briefly mention is the research-based uh, installation ZOO, or the letter Z, just after Zionism. Uh, the word ZOO is, uh, on, comes from the last page of the Atlas of the Conflict, which includes um, a, lexic uh, a lexicon, um, and uh, the last page has two terms in it, ZOO and Zionism. The term zoo uh, describe a struggle of a small private uh, urban, zoo, uh, urban zoo in Gaza City to survive uh, and highlighted uh, how Gazan zookeepers drew black stripes on white donkeys and caged them as if they were zebras after losing many of their exotic animals amid ongoing wars and lack of uh, access to medicine and veterinary, veterinarian know-how. And Zionism, we uh, likely all know, stands for the uh, national ideology that called for the establishment of a homeland for, of, uh, for the historically prosecuted Jewish nation in Palestine. The two terms or invention, the urban zoo and the nation state, can be traced back to the age of enlightenment and to its fixation on classification. We spent about a year working uh, on the exhibition and researching Gaza from the perspective of uh, this uh, kind of classification going wrong. The Gaza Strip is a small occupied enclave bordered by Israel and Egypt. It is the home to approximately 2 million inhabitants who resides in an area of 365 square kilometers. Since 2007, the region has been, uh, this area, Gaza was uh, under a, a land, sea, and air blockade. Today, the population faces unprecedented uh, attacks, leading to the displacement, their displacement toward this red um, area that is marked on the map. Uh, we started Zoo by uh, sketching maps and section to render visible uh, along with its, um, it, sorry, to render visible the walls enclosing Gaza, along with its uh, imposed and shifting uh, maritime boundaries. Let me see. We also studied the development and architecture of uh, urban zoo throughout, um, I won't say history, but uh, the 20th century. And we spent time to carefully document Maryland, the zoo in Gaza City where the donkeys were caged. We examined scientific illustration of uh, various species, and we gradually uh, began to mixing it all up. We embroidered imaginary animals, replacing their background with elements borrowed from uh, news items on Gaza. And this drawing shows the, exhibitions, the, ex the exhibition that we designed where you can see the cage, um, the archive, the lexicon, uh, which were also placed uh, along the gallery windows. Uh, we designed a hard cage that turned into a living room and then transformed into a soft cage made of macrame. We turned the architectural gallery into a menagerie hosting donkeys, uh, rats, and pigeons. And we had the honor of uh, being joined by Mahmoud Baragut, the Gazan zookeeper who drew the black stripes on the donkey. A few years later, we had another uh, iteration of zoo, which was exhibited at the Tropic Institute in Lisbon, in Portugal. Uh, digging into the archive of their colonial rema remains, we managed to find donkeys, pigeons, and rats to tell the story of zoo. In the context uh, that could uh, 
further expand the narrative of colonial legacy and all power dynamics of uh, global extraction. Elements from Zoo and the Atlas were also embedded in a seven and a half meter weave that we exhibited at the 2021 Venice Architecture Biennale. Uh, in 2019, we received an open-ended uh, and unspecific uh, specified invitation to propose a project for the Biennale. And we decided to use this informal, uh, this uh, international platform to speak about Gaza and to share matter of concerns with the public using the Biennale as an effective stage for uh, public outreach and for activism. Um, our project, Border Ecologies and the Gaza Strip, Watermelon, Sardines, Crab, Sand and Sediment, is an advocacy, sorry, advocacy, an archival uh, project that we undertook in collaboration with a small farm situated along, along one of the most uh, militarized and violent borders in the world. The project explored the emergence of unexpected spaces in response to stresses and war at the Israeli-Palestinian border. For nearly a century, fluctuation in the shape and form of the border have affected both human and natural ecologies, leading to the formation of spaces of exception. The project then focused on the transformation of one space in particular, that of a small family farm. With the exhibition, we shared stories of daily uh, life on the farm, which we collected through uh, our weekly conversations with the family. We linked mundane material, object, and things to bureaucratic protocols, Israeli imposed restrictions, and ongoing acts of violence. Through our exploration, we discovered and shared how these extreme conditions led to the emergence of those spaces that at times seems more resilient than others uh, with a steadier uh, history, per particularly since the family's uh, survival, uh, uh, in this case, was made possible by robust collective uh, acts of mutual aid and solidarity. The violence at its border region is with no end. Since the horrifying attack of Hamas on October 7th on Israeli civilians, Israel dropped thousands of bombs on Gaza, more than in any other recently recorded history, each creating a crater of 12 meters of, or more. The farm is completely destroyed by now. And uh, it's also designated, its area is designated to become part of a new buffer zone between Gaza and Israel. Um, and farming in Gaza was always a difficult task. Now it's even harder, if not impossible. The soil in Gaza is thoroughly toxified by munition. The air thick with unbreathable uh, uh, smoke. The aquifer now uh, inundated by seawater. Recent rains which have flooded the area have pulled the thick smoke down deeper into the soil and it will remain nearly uh, where it will be, where it will remain, sorry, nearly indefinitely. This is a war waged on people and the environment, on the, and on the already very fragile and overburdened life and ecology of Gaza. The contamination is neither local nor temporary and it will take long to remediate it. The old people who owns, the old couple that owns the farm are now displaced to a small area they share with the rest of uh, the almost one and a half million Gazans, the same, the same area that I indicated with the red spot uh, in the previous map. Uh, so they are in, in Rafa near the border with Egypt. Their health condition is dire and their survival continue to depend on acts of mutual aid. Despite the immense challenges during this time, I remain committed to this project. 
I believe that especially in today's circumstances, storytelling can play a crucial role. It's not only allow us to shed light on life in spaces that are inaccessible to us, but it also helps us to recognize the humanity in each other. Through storytelling, we can hopefully find a way forward together, especially during this horrific time. Um, I would like to take a moment to discuss uh, how we have used this uh, project not only to showcase the, the story of the farm, but also as an attempt to reimagine and broaden uh, the archive. In our projects, we often work with archives to uncover violence and to find creative ways to preserve marginalized history facing erasure. Uh, the project, this project, Border Ecologies and the Gaza Strip, is a documentation of a multi-year uh, dialogue. Through this engagement, we collected oral histories and digital copies of diverse documents and artifacts provided by the communities. Some of them have been gone now uh, during the war. Um, so, using this material, we crafted a, an initial seven and a half meter weave um, with timelines, drawing, and stories linked through a barcode to a dynamic online uh, platform that we keep expanding. Our conversations with, with the family are still ongoing. This tablecloth, crafted in collaboration with a master weaver in Tilburg uh, Textile Museum, serves as an artifact and is preserved in the museum archive. We ensure that it not only uh, showcases a design, but also carries stories within it. And by leveraging cultural production infrastructure, we have uh, been able to create unexpected spaces for documenting, preserving, and archiving stories. The project won the Silver Lion at the Biennale, and the jury saw the project as daring and thought-provoking, inviting reflection on divided history, agricultural practices, daily rituals, and realities of settlement and occupation. The prize allows, among others, to preserve the villagers' stories yet in another international archive. So before finishing, I'd like to return to Blue. I hope you have energy for a little bit more. So confronted with the landscape we saw in Kosovo and the enormous magnitude of uh, complexities, right, encompassed in this uh, world of UN peacekeeping mission, we had to invent our own way uh, of conducting research. And we didn't really know where to begin. And this quote is also a retroactive quote that have been pulled out after, which seems to reflect the process that we've been going uh, through. So in Becoming Research, Yurit Rogov argues that research today allows a small amount of agency within a world whose rampant neoliberal drives have taken away both agency and the ability to actually argue points in terms of content and substance. The shift from someone who expressed themselves individually to the position of being a researcher is also a shift in which one um, allows oneself to uh, get involved with the, working of, with the workings of institutions, of protocols, of memory, and uh, uh, of community. Our research and design project, uh, Blue, had to operate in all these realms, outside of the neoliberal logic and contingent on institutions, protocols, uh, memory, and community. So as I mentioned earlier, Blue aimed to study and make visible the impact of UN peacekeeping missions on different environments, on uh, rural environments, on cities, um, and uh, etc. So to do this, we had to work on multiple fronts and forge alliance with uh, institutions. We had to speak with divert, uh, diverse experts and uh, contact directly uh, con uh, constituent affected by the mission in mission areas through during our field uh, research. Uh, we collaborated with International Policy Institute to create an, uh, a comprehensive matrix for policymakers, where we uh, and with that we try to set guidelines, uh, building on existing policies and um, uh, ideas that are kind of circulating at that time at the UN. And uh, and uh, what we try to do is to use this idea and see how we can br bring design in and think together 
with all these things on how uh, to um, uh, reduce the environmental uh, footprint of, uh, uh, of these missions and shift, and more importantly, uh, shift resources from pl private global supply chains to local residents as an, uh, as an essential st step in sustaining peace. Um, the blue exhibition at the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale served as a forum to interact with policymakers, access information and share our findings uh, with the public. Uh, we used the design and 3D modeling to illustrate spatio-temporal transition, uh, transitional strategies and prioritize the well-being, that prioritized the well-being of uh, residents and the environment, and we disseminated our findings and recommendations uh, across a range of platforms, uh, architectural archives and libraries, uh, with the support of International uh, Research Institute. Uh, we also developed policy papers, and we inserted uh, uh, an article with new words and new paragraph to a UN resolution on peacekeeping missions in 2017. Uh, as th at the same time, we also sought to broaden the field of architecture, expanding um, ideas of what it can do. So the Blue Project, for instance, included 16 models uh, that it's very minor detail, but I'll try to make it uh, interesting. Um, in this context. So the Blue uh, Project, for instance, included 16 models that tell the stories of uh, European missions through a series of encounters. They are models are, or material artifact of the built environment that themselves serves as testimony in the archive beyond the typical purview uh, of single uh, authors. Uh, authored models. The models depict a range of uh, mission typologies from the missionary tent used in, the early, in early modernity uh, to narratives that cover the early explorers sent by boats to uh, observe and extra extract uh, resources uh, from the African continent uh, to elsewhere in the world next to uh, more ancient uh, Tuareg tents and other nomadic structures. We also created models of improvised watchtowers and toilets erected after the end of the Cold War in the post-Soviet countries that we received from uh, military engineers' personal archives working in these missions. Uh, and we documented current uh, uh, privately owned global supply chain companies that assume production of mission uh, spaces after the financial crisis of 2008, when the UN had to delegate uh, the production of space uh, outside of the institution. And it resulted with the production of supersized camps within and around more than 100 African cities. Um, our 16 models as uh, testaments to the architectural and spatial footprint of these missions are now part of the Netherlands Architecture Archive, uh, the largest architecture uh, archive in the world. So I'm almost done. Uh, conflict produces a unique kind of transparency as it exposes the underlying drivers, narratives, and power struggles, along with individual and collective experience that shape uh, the built environment. By working at the scale of conflict and addressing both the, sy the systems that produce it and the people living through it, we attempt to find ways to take on, understand, and embrace complexity. Through conflict, we understand how the big things like colonialism, capitalism, extraction, war, meet and influence smaller things like personal narratives of home, trauma, human vulnerability, and you can turn it around. Through conflict, we see the tension between the isolation of, mixed, uh, of fixed borders and the restrictive policy and the fluidity and exchange of ideas, resources, and emotions. And by embracing conflict, we can cultivate a practice that is itself fluid enough to enter these spaces, to engage with people and the complexity involved, and to build trust and find a way forward. Through this work, but by not avoiding conflict, but understanding how it works on many levels, we do not 
we hope we do not add conflict to conflict, but hopefully, and in, the, in this sense, this all work that we do is full of hope, uh, find a human potential for change. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, um, I, I am uh, sort of speechless in terms of your know, admiration for the range of your work and the, the range that you showed us and the sort of um, topics that you've taken on. And, and also uh, speechless in trying to figure out a way to, to enter in. And one of, the, one of the things that first comes to mind, really, is this question of overlap and just the technique that you used for the lecture, but also for your method of inquiry, and how it is that you combine a method that is a method of assemblage and, and um, uh, that ranges from the narrative to policy, um, and how you cut a line through that to uh, reach a goal. For example, the, the adding uh, paragraphs to the UN statement is a sort of a goal that no one I know has achieved, um, and not one that you would think would come out of this overlap of image, of story, of all of these things. And so um, this is maybe a little unfair because you've just spent an hour telling us how you work, but if I can push for a little bit, how you go from that um, assemblage of material to uh, uh, your precise interventions. Yeah, so I hope this works. Okay, so it's um, staying uh, in a project for a long time and getting to understand it as deeper as we can. So each of our projects took about a decade, or sometimes longer. None of the project ever ended. I mean, the class that I'm teaching now with the UN agencies on climate strategies for climate migration, we are hosting every week a few uh, UN officers in the classroom to discuss this space. And there are eagerly engaged with special designers because they also understand that the meaning of their policies uh, come about in the way they land, literally land in space. And uh, they will also want to understand what a word in their policy might mean in people's reality. And this level of abstraction of policy can benefit from what we do. So I think remaining uh, in a project, in a space for a long time, learn, teach you also how to understand other professional languages, other, how other practices, because also even terms. At the beginning of meetings, we always use different terms because we call things differently. Everything, the, the world is so siloed that uh, by now it's, it's really hard to find a common language. And, uh, so I think the entire project and also this assemblage is an attempt to uh, find a common language in all these intersections of where architecture and the built environment touches. And of course, we don't go all over the world. It's always, almost like an acupuncture. You go into one space, and from that space, you try to understand its complexities with all the different narratives without um, and stories and histories, and it's a lot, and of course, probably we only, I only understand a fraction of it. Uh, but at the same time, there is a sensibility within the process and the, the, the outcome, which is never ending, <laughs> to kind of bring all this uh, story, to give space for all these realities to exist, also those that we don't know. Uh, and that's an exciting process, and finding this common ground and using the tools of 
because I, I, was, I studied architecture, so being able to work through all these scales, you know, like from the scale of our body to the scale of the neighborhood to the, uh, the scale of the house to the scale of the neighborhood and the city and the master plan, uh, you need to, you are trained to think on multiple, in multiple dimensions and level of abstraction that is super exciting to take on and bring into a different space. Which I is, appreciate that optimism for a design education. Um, yeah. But so, the, uh, the other question I have, which is um, probably a little bit of an obvious one, is simply access. How do you ha gain access to these people at the UN or, or to the two farmers, the, the couple who, old couple who own the farm? How do you gain access to these stories at one hand, the very personal individual narratives that you offer, and on the other hand, the guy, the guy in the with all the medals on him, who is not someone we normally encounter or know how to talk to, but, but how do you even gain access to these conversations? We are all humans. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's, I don't think that, so I would like to actually engage with hope now, after all these stories. I think the world is not as hermetic as we perceive it to be. And once you start knocking on the door, someone will open. So sometimes the doors are not there, so you need to imagine them and kind of uh, engage in, you know, in a process of, um, uh, you know, finding ways to um, see how this door can exist, you know, and then you figure out who are the people to, that help, may help you. Like, for instance, in the case of the, um, the questions that we had about the peacekeeping, we knew that, I knew that if I will work with an institution, then it will be harder, it will be easier to access other institutions. And I just finished uh, the project on Zoo, uh, and it was uh, commissioned by Hus Bomer, who just after uh, I f we finished displaying the exhibition, he, got, uh, he was appointed as the um, director of the new institute, at new institute in uh, Rotterdam. And he asked me to come along. And I didn't want to work in an institution, but I said I can propose a, a project, and I have a project in mind, and I told him what I want to do, and I said, okay, this is what I have. This is the policies of the institutions. This is the formats that we are allowed to use. This is our budget, what you can do see what you can do with it. And uh, it was the beginning, the first days of the new institute, and uh, the only ways that they could commission work, they didn't have budget for research, and the only way they, they could commission work is to uh, make us, make everything be public. Everything needs to be accessible to the public. So I proposed a series of uh, uh, symposiums, like the Drone Salon, and all kinds of uh, strange titles, and I started inviting the military uh, head of the drone program and some human rights lawyers from um, Leiden University and I brought all kinds of people unexpectedly together and the conversations were really exciting and uh, everything is documented and videoed and like and, uh, uh, and uh, like well documented by the, the institution but it also helped progress. Um, and our projects are rooted in activism, and it means that you need to stay, again, a long time in a space and build trust. And this is what happened in Anhud. I was there all the time. I, was, I, I, really, I literally studied architecture there from the different perspectives. So the modernist models I studied at the Technion and the other counter-narrative at the unrecognized village, uh, understanding how informality uh, works. Um, so from super formal to super informal. And uh, so I think it's also about building trust and not shying away. I think everything is open. We just need to uh, go for it. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions. And we have mic runners. I also will keep an eye on the um, iPad, which tells me if there are people from the audience outside who have questions. but. Does anyone here have a question? Ed. Uh, Maki, first of all, thank you for that very beautiful, inspiring talk. It, it's more of an observation about the zoo, which I find fascinating. And it just strikes me that in the Hebrew alphabet, Taf is the last letter, not Z. And, um, which is the first letter of Teva, 
um, arc, right? Because um, when I looked at that, I thought very much this was a vehicle of salvation. And if I'm not mistaken, Teva is also the word for the basket that Moses was put in to save him, uh, uh, the plague. But I just, it, it, it made me an image, it was very ho hopeful in the face of a, a universal cataclysm that these creatures would be saved. Thank you for this. Uh, it's not a fully formed question, but <laughs> I think your sites of investigation, as obviously it's very challenging. And in those kinds of situations, I think people tend to look for relatively immediate and fast solutions to these problems. It, does, it exhausts um, a lot of things, and most importantly, imagination, in my opinion. How do you persist to imagine sort of different futures, despite the fact that the reality pushes you to save the world right now, right here? And when you, like, I don't, I wonder how you deal with your frustrations when, when nothing really changes in short period of time. I get vertigo. <laughs> it's, um, no, it's really hard. But I, it is hard. The world is, uh, things are changing quickly and slowly at the same time. And, uh, one of the reasons that the conversation, for instance, also with the UN was so successful with the UN agencies is because they also realized that they have a blind spot in their strategies because they are, the entire organization is designed to give aid in a very short time for the, the, just to resolve problems quickly. They only work with engineers. They don't have this long-term perspective on conflict. Even though some of the missions that we were looking in, like the first mission was actually in Israel-Palestine, the first peacekeeping mission was in israel Palestine. It's still going on, right? So these missions last 70 years, um, 50 years, 30 years. So they have a long-term you know, presence in a space, but the policies are changing on a yearly base, right? The budget, the personnel, the perspectives, uh, the politics of it. Uh, so we said, why won't we try to think differently about that? Continue doing what you are doing, because this is what you are trained to do, and this is what you have budget for. You cannot intervene in that at this point. But let's develop a, a, a parallel trajectory that, think, that take into account a longer future and different perspectives just to bring back this imagination that is lost in the immediate humanitarian kind of assistance. Uh, and I think it's critical because otherwise you have like incredible waste of resources. Uh, and at this, at this time, especially when the situation at the UN is becoming precarious as it was in, the, in 2008, they delegate much of the production of everything they do to private uh, supply chains that inflate the waste uh, that, create, that they are working with a completely different mentality of making profit, and uh, it creates awful conditions. So um, I think being able to understand this complexity and see where we can find hope even in the most awful situation is actually important because this situation lasts for a long time and impacts people for a long time. I have a non-formal question also in some ways. Um, and I think I've been involved in um, an initiative to build playground for children in refugee camp. I think yeah. we exchange email. And uh, I think at the, when we started, I was not able to find the door of the UN. Uh, you know, they said, as you said, it's temporary. And when there's a need for water, for food, for shelter, play seems like ludicrous in some ways, but it's so important. And I'm also, so I mean, when I found interesting is I realize though between the needs, the very basic needs, and this is what the UNITE, UN is doing also, and the poetry and the story, 
you're able to reconcile both. And I see that general too. And you're able to bring it on your terrain. And I think this is one thing when I must say I'm struggling, you know, to be able to mesh the story with the very pragmatic term we're being given with a budget and a specific site and the need for water and shelter. So that's a bit vague, but I, I mean, there's something you're doing that is very human as a way. And I just want if you could explain a bit more uh, if this is a direct enough question. Thank you. Um, I think this work really embraces life, you know, and all the complexity that comes with it. And of course, there are the values that we are like view storytelling to um, tell this layered history uh, and to uh, advocate for social justice, especially in these spaces. But at the same time, I, you know, life is complex and it's really hard to grab it all and to make a change from one moment to the other. So change takes time. And so we start, um, we invest a lot of time in the incremental, you know, step by step, slowly making uh, things change. And if they can be systemic, it's even better because then it can scale up. Uh, but we also just in, engage with all this complexity because I don't, I don't want to live in a world of good and bad because the world is much more complex. I don't want to w live in a world that is overly polarized, that we stop seeing each other because of these words that we use. Um, and I think we can see it in our daily life, this polarization. Uh, and I think life is much more complex than that. And we have to start humanizing each, each other and others in order to be able to, um, um, to actually uh, produce something that is meaningful to live. Uh, this is the, the kind of world that I would like to live in, is the world that is able to humanize the other. Uh, and I try to do it with my work. And uh, it comes on all scales and on all levels. So if, um, if it is to speak with a general and have another uh, understanding of this complexity is fine. And uh, without having access also to information that otherwise is classified, it's also even more fine because it allows you a uh, way in, right? Um, so you also need to be very strategic um, in order to uh, navigate these spaces. Yeah. Hi, Malkit. Um, yeah, maybe as a follow up question to that. Um, I am also associating this kind of matter of conflict, not just um, um, as interpersonal, but also personal. And I'm thinking back to Toni Morrison's kind of note on the need for shame um, as a door to really face your personal truth. So this kind of need to face your own contradiction, I almost think it's very necessary in order to jump to the scale of facing contradiction among the collective, facing co contradiction in the system. Um, so I, I'm wondering how much you've reflected on and developed on the need for a very personal um, em embracing of, of contradictory values within oneself and how we eventually kind of build on that to uh, produce trust uh, among one another. I think my values are, remain always the same. I don't think they're uh, contradictory. It's just um, the way you speak and give space for other things around you to take place is something else than values. Um, and that's important. I think when you give space, you learn to understand your environment better. And there is a better possibilities for conversation, right, and engagement. and humanization and then eventually change. So it's not about the value, but it's really about the process of how to get from one reality to the other with a lot of hope in between. Uh, and everything is personal at the end of the day. You know, my work, my work st starts at home and it also ends there.
Sorry. We do have a question from Karina Arvizu, who says, thank you for a beautiful, inspiring lecture, but also asks, how do you envision a future for the family you worked with at Border Ecologies? Thank you for sharing the past and their present. How do you envision this research forward? Yeah. It's hard. So it's a very difficult question, very emotional one, because uh, the family is not in a good state at this moment. The last I've heard, I think it was two days ago, they are very sick and they are looking for evacuation out of, the, out of Gaza. Um, I remain um, really engaged, like this project won't end here. I feel it needs, it will continue. I don't know what the future of this project will be and what shape it will take. It started as a series of conversations and the conversation continue. We keep documenting this space. Also it's erasure and what is happening now that is very um, tragic, very, it's, it's awful. Um, but yeah, we continue to, to speak. It's the only thing we can do. So I, you have, um, many different formats and you speak to different audiences and as you said you sort of um, you find a common language but actually I think you operate as a, a extraordinary translator who operates you know with the language of the UN the language of someone on the ground the language of, of this world of, of designers of professional architects of students um, but I, I wonder if one might suggest one more language or one more um, uh, let's say, um, medium for you to operate in right now at a moment that's quite urgent to tell these stories, which would be that of the public press. And, and is that one that, so there's a difference between exhibiting publicly at the Biennale yeah. and reaching that audience um, or your publications. Um, you've had an impact on the UN, but is there a way that you could have an impact on a broader public? It's hard, it depends, I mean, me, the media world is, uh, is also very um, tricky. Uh, so um, if the story is good, they follow, because they also covered some of our stories. I mean, the, the work in Enhud, in Hood, the first uh, moment we came to the village with all the artists, suddenly the new, news reporters were there and followed the news reporters. The uh, regional council decided to fix the road because they don't want the incidents in the car accidents in the, in the village. So we already made a change before the event even started. And so this is the power of media, right? Uh, with the, and also there, you know, personal stories and uh, uh, interests of journalists come intersect with the interest of the story. So it's also, you cannot manipulate it. It either, it either, it's either comes or goes, and I don't want to have an agent because it's like, it's not the way this uh, uh, project should go. So for instance, with the UN peacekeeping missions, when uh, one of the like main journalists or, not main, but a central journalist to the NRC in the Netherlands, which is a daily newspaper, heard about his story, immediately asked for an interview, and he put it on the front page of the NRC. And after that, all the generals arrived, and then they wanted to open the pavilion, and then we got more and more access again. So th there is a lot of power in media. Uh, now, after October 7th, I've been approached and I've been in conversation for a few years, like since the beginning with the Aretz newspaper in Israel, and one of the journalists contacted me and said, well, it's, it's terrible, we are all depressed, it's insane what is happening here, we need your voice, so can, can we have a, 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 an interview, can we, dis can we talk? And of course, I immediately open all, everything and give access to information and allow them to use also our, the work that we have produced to tell these complex narratives because oftentimes the media don't have the, 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 also the means to engage with this complexity. Um, so I don't know if there is another medium. I think each project is slightly different and each project require a different methods. I didn't think that I will weave textile and I didn't think that I will embroider and I didn't think that I will write policy papers, but each project bring its own complexity and open its own walls. 
and then you embrace them. It's okay, so I, I'm not, I don't know how to write policy, but let's collaborate with policy institutions and see how we can work together. So we worked together for a few years, we produced policy papers, and we moved on. So this intersectionality is actually really important because it allows you to not master all these mediums, but to just kind of work through them. And every time it's necessary, you pick up thing and you move to the other thing. I think that's why we are incredibly lucky to have you teaching with us and sharing that pedagogy. And you're um, the sort of perfect model. You were one of the first people who came to our minds when we thought about the Open Project as a new pedagogical strategy for using different media, using different voices, and, and putting things together. Um, I'll, I'll close there, um, but just to say that this continues. The next event will be a lunchtime event with the Women in Design group um, on spaces of conflict designing for peace, and that's on March 8th uh, at lunchtime. I think it's in the library, right? Yeah, so I, there was another section that was, part, that was supposed to be part of this uh, presentation speaking about the desert as a space we've been engaged with for also since the beginning, since, since 2007. And um, so I removed it from here. I moved it to Women in Design. I think it will be interesting to speak about the desert then. And I invited uh, Suhad Bishara, who is a human rights lawyer working at Adala. It's a human rights organization that is based in Haifa. Uh, to, um, and she, like her motto, which I love, I always I, I like to invite and have a conversation with her because she always says, I always uh, lose the case, but I win the narrative. And uh, so she presents all the court cases at the Israeli Supreme Court uh, representing the unrecognized villages. And most of them are Bedouin living in the south of Israel in the desert region or in the arid uh, region. Um, and uh, we will have a conversation about these spaces. Um, at the fringe of, yeah, all the rest. So I invite everyone to join us again then, um, but for now, let's thank Melkit. Thank you.